so uh, good morning everybody uh, today i will be talking about a multifaceted longitudinal measurements uh, that shed light on the performance and operations of starlink uh, this work is a result of a collaboration between technical university of munich in germany and in university of edinburgh in uh, uk all right so in recent years low earth orbit mega constellations have actually revolutionized the global internet connectivity and accessibility right so the starlink network from spacex stands out as the only commercial leo networks with more than 4 4000 operational satellites at the moment uh, and they intend to offer low latency and high bandwidth coverage to 2 million subscribers deployed in a number of 60 plus different countries right so starlink actually also also plans on deploying 60 for more than 40000 satellites in the coming years and uh, it's really aiming to become this global internet service provider However, the end-to-end -end connectivity in Leo networks is very difficult to assess because of the various internal uh, network deployments and management decisions that Starlink or any other Leo network operator might take. For instance, if you look into these uh, orbits here, Starlink is deploying its satellites in three major planes, right? And these are the angles that you create with the equator of the Earth. So these are 53 degree angles, the 70 degree angles, and the 97.6 degree orbital shells. Majority of the satellites are actually deployed in the 53 degree orbital shell here. and the reason for this becomes clear if you flatten this picture of the earth no pun intended uh, you tend to see that these 53 degree orbit actually covers the most populated regions of the earth so these are covering uh, right now they have more than 3000 plus satellites deployed the rest of these orbit the 70 70 degree and the 97.6 degree orbits are uh, much sparser but they provide connectivity to these polar regions where uh, there might be connectivity holes otherwise Uh, but this what what this essentially means that if you are doing any measurements on starlink and you're trying to assess what the network quality is and if you are in, within one of these 53 degree orbits you cannot make assessments about the global performance of star, uh, starlink because you're not getting the same amount of satellites everywhere the other reason is the inconsistency can can be because of how starlink is actually operating its end to end performance you might assume that starlink is a satellite operator so it's pretty much using all the satellites to make the connectivity but that's not the case starlink is very much reliant on the ground infrastructure as well right uh, because it follows what we uh, uh, very popularly call as the bent pipe connectivity if we look into the star uh, the cross section of this bent pipe connectivity you have a starlink terminal and the starlink terminal actually connects to connects to the satellite which is in its field of view but then the the satellite actually relays your connection to the nearest ground station the ground station then connects you to the point of presence and then you go over the outside internet now this terminal to satellite to ground station to point of presence actually looks like a bent pipe which is why it is known as a bent pipe connection uh but what is interesting to assume here uh, to see here is that all of these satellites are actually moving very fast in space as well around 27000 kilometers per hour which means that all of these uh, links are actually very dynamic and they change very effectively uh now to also uh, ensure that uh, you don't have to rely on always the ground station which is in the single field of view of a single satellite uh starlink actually also uses an intersatellite laser links to interconnected satellites uh what this means is you can now create an extended bent pipe if one satellite cannot reach both the starlink terminal and the ground station you can actually use a combination of multiple laser links to get to wherever the ground station is and then you can exit out of the ground station infrastructure but uh what this essentially means is that starlink will be very much reliant on where the ground station are deployed and how your point of presence is are available uh now in this work we actually aim to provide the first comprehensive multi uh, faceted analysis of starlink and to understand uh what all of these internal operations and uh, management decisions have impact on end to end and global performance of starlink as well right so we do this from three different ways Number one, we do a global uh, measurements and performance analysis of Starlink. We rely on two different data sets here. So number one is this measurement lab uh, speed tests. These are all open source, owned by Google, uh, but these essentially gives us access to 19.2 million data points from Starlink users that have done speed tests over measurement labs, uh, and this is covered in approximately 34 countries. So this is a pro approximately 70 to 80 percent coverage of the entire Starlink uh, coverage as of now. uh but this is end to end performance as well right because it's only giving us what the end throughput is what is the latency it doesn't give us a break up of uh latencies between uh, across the entire path so for that we actually do active measurements over ripe atlas probes as well so uh these ripe atlas we had about 98 different probes that were deployed in 21 different countries these were retrofitted with uh starlink satellite connections and this allows us to do trace routes and pings to actually understand uh the ground station availability bent pipe latencies and all the other intersatellite link uh metrics how that affect the end to end performances 
Secondly, we also intend to understand what is the impact of all of these management decisions on end applications. So for that, we actually uh, look into two different applications. One is Zoom video conferencing and the other one is Amazon Luna Cloud Gaming. Uh, we actually perform several experiments where we compare Starlink to terrestrial Ethernet as well as uh, to 5G cellular. And we try to understand uh, how does the various operational factors of Starlink impact your end-to-end -end quality of experience or quality of service. And finally, uh, we try to understand uh, what, uh, how Starlink is actually operating its inter uh, internal network here. So we do a lot of high frequency measurements uh, from our dishes in uh, Germany and the United Kingdom. Uh, so we try to understand uh, what are the various factors, for example, the orbital shell coverage as well as the locations and do these internal operation decisions are uh, consistent across multiple orbital shells or not. We also intend to understand uh, what is the satellite handover uh, behaviors that Starlink is using. So we do uh, some controlled experiments from a dish in United Kingdom, which is only covered from the south in 53 degree uh, orbit. So we put a metal shielding there. So we uh, restrict the dish uh, from getting connectivity from this 53 degree shell. Uh, and it only gets connectivity from the 70 degree and the 97.6 degree cell. And now we can correlate when satellites are changing and are moving in and out of the field of view. How is it affecting the end-to-end -end performance and the latencies that this particular dish is seeing? All right, so for this uh, particular uh, talk, I will only be talking about our global performance measurements, but I highly recommend you to check out our full paper for more details on the rest of the experiments that we did. Okay, so uh, let's look into the data from these measurement lab measurements here. So here we show two different plots. These are median min RTT latencies that are reported by the users when they actually do speed tests to the nearest Google Cloud data center here. So the left one uh, on this side is actually showing measurements from Starlink. And the right one is showing the measurements from top three mobile network operators from each different country. What we can observe is that the best round trip time performance of Starlink is in the order of 40 to 50 milliseconds or so. Uh, but if you look into uh, the mobile network operators, this is around 30 milliseconds. Uh, what we also see is that Starlink performs almost at par of terrestrial cellular in selected regions like Europe, USA, and so on. Uh, but in regions such as South America or, for example, in parts of Africa, the performance is really bad. This is very peculiar, right? Because you have the same amount of satellites deployed in orbit. So all of these regions, especially, are covered by the same 53 degree orbit as well. So why are they getting different performances? Where your uh, US is getting less than 40 milliseconds, but if you look into uh, Japan, uh, it is getting a, a little bit higher as well, right? Same for South America and versus Africa here. And this becomes clear if you actually correlate the performances that we are observing with the ground station infrastructure that Starlink is also deploying. So these brown circles are the ground stations that Starlink is using, and the, uh, the blue triangles are the point of presence. So we see that uh, the uh, regions with dense ground infrastructure deployment tends to have a better performance, uh, which is, you can see, for example, in Seattle. Uh, but if you look into Mexico City, which only has a sparse availability of ground stations nearby, uh, it has a higher latency and a longer tails in performance as well. In fact, if you look into the US performance uh, or, uh, across the entire country, it is extremely very consistent, uh, regardless of wherever you're connecting from, because this country has a significant deployment of ground station infrastructure to connect you. Uh, in Europe, you start to see the impact of ground infrastructure more uh, significantly. In Europe, you only have three different uh, uh, POPs available, which is in UK, Germany, and Spain. And that is why you see the latency from Dublin, London, and Berlin, uh, which is comparable to US. But if you look into Rome, and then, for example, in Paris, the latencies are significantly higher. Uh, this is what I also want to note here, is that we saw the latency differences mostly in the, uh, the latencies, actually, between these regions. Throughputs were very comparable uh, globally here. So Starlink seems to be prioritizing for throughput rather than latencies as of now. Uh, I would like to now like to share a very interesting use case of Manila and Philippines, which actually highlights the importance of ground infrastructure. So before May 2023, Starlink subscribers could only connect to the ground station infrastructure, uh, ground station which was deployed in the Philippines, but they were mapped to the point of presence which were deployed in Japan. So all the connections that were originating from Philippines using Starlink had to actually traverse this long Jupiter subsea cables to get to uh, the POP and then go wherever the destination server was. So the impact of this is clear when you start to compare the performance between the Philippines uh, Starlink users in Philippines connecting to a server in Philippines, which is shown in the solid, and versus if you are connecting to a server in Japan. 
where the server in Japan gets 50 to 70 milliseconds lower latencies because for Philippines, you have to come back and you have to traverse this subsea cable twice. Uh, but after May 2023, Starlink actually installed a local POP in Philippines as well. So now uh, all the traffic to the local servers could actually exit out of the local uh, POP as well. And now you start to see the trends actually reverse. So uh, servers, uh, traffic going to the local servers are getting approximately 30 to 40 milliseconds lower latencies versus if you're going to Japan here. So this actually highlights the uh, benefits of showcasing uh, how ground infrastructure can actually help end-to-end uh, -end performance. But this is only dependent if your terrestrial network infrastructure is really good. Right? Some Many parts of the regions of the globe are do not have good fiber deployments. So in those cases, Starlink is actually pretty useful as well because it can now use inter-satellite links to connect those regions. Right. Uh, so I want to sh also show one other use case study uh, where we knew that the Starlink is using ISL. So this is from Reunion Island, which is in the southern part of Africa here. So this, what we found here is that these uh, Starlink terminals were connected and were exiting out of the point of presence in Germany. Uh, so our initial assumption was that maybe they were using the ground station in Nigeria and then they were exiting out of Germany using the terrestrial infrastructure. But if we looked into the latencies between the ground station and the, uh, the point of presence, this was less than five milliseconds. So this was not possible, which meant that the ground station was being used somewhere near Germany as well. Uh, now the distance between the Union Island and Germany here is about 9,000 kilometers. Starlink satellites are flying at around uh, 500 kilometers or so. So the maximum coverage that they can do is around 1,200 kilometers in the total diameter. So this is not possible to be covered by a single satellite, this large distance. So this is very likely using an inter-satellite link. In fact, a series of inter-satellite links. Uh, and now we can actually see how this, uh, what is the latencies that links are imparting. So this plot here actually shows uh, the band pipe latencies between the user terminal to ground station and the ground station to the point of presence. The latency from the reunion island probe here is shown in yellow. And uh, for comparison, we also show the latency from a Starlink probe in Germany, which is also using the same point of presence as well. So we can see that both the reunion island and the Germany dish are using the same, uh, have the same ground station to pop latencies, which likely means that they're using the same ground stations as well. On the other hand, the German Starlink terminal is only uh, using uh, 40 milliseconds and the last mile, whereas the Union Island is using 150 milliseconds. So there is a significantly higher latencies because of inter-satellite links. The interesting bit is if you, we also show for comparison, the latencies from uh, the Union Island via fiber, if you were to go to Germany. So that is the, the, wild, the blue vertical line that we show here. And what we can see is that ISLs actually have significantly lower latencies if you were to connect using a regular terrestrial ethernet from the Union Island. And that is because this island is very far off and it is connected by a series of very bad subsea cables to get to either South America or to uh, US before it can come back to Germany here. So ISLs actually have uh, a potential for improving performance. All right. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, what I want to highlight is that uh, Starlink actually has quite, um, uh, has a lot of potential for improving performances. But what we found out in our studies is that it suffers from a lot of uh, internal operation issues as well. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, please check out the full paper. Uh, we also make our data set of 300 gigabytes actually completely open for future research. Uh, and if you have any questions, please reach out to me and I'm happy to take them right now.